are two bills listed underneath letter D in Congress. There is a Senate bill 2677 and a House bill 4277. These are the current Cong congressional session bills on overdraft reform. They're not the first of their kind. Uh, I want to say every congressional session back to 2009 for sure, and maybe even earlier than that, had some sort of overdraft reform bill that was created. They all went nowhere. Okay? They, they, I mean, they didn't even make it to committees to get voted on and, and dealt with there. The interesting thing that has happened in 2022, and it's likely due to all of the legwork that was put in over the last six, eight, 10 months, whatever it has been since they really started pushing overdraft reform, got this to go a little further. So I'm going to give you some, some information here. And so hopefully you were able to, to print out or at least pull up that uh, handout that we've included in addition to the manual. And if, again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, head over to the chat button. Uh, our team has placed a one-page document there. It should be table. It should be titled at the top HR 4277, um, the Overdraft Protection Act of 2022. The House has voted on it and actually passed through this committee uh, the bill, and I'll explain why that's significant here in a minute. Let me start with the Senate bill, though, okay, the one that hasn't gone anywhere just yet, because it's actually more restrictive than the one I'm going to go into detail on. That Stop Overdraft Profiteering Act of 2021, the Senate Bill 2677. Let me give you a couple of things that aren't on that extra handout. So that Senate bill, no overdrafts ever for ATMs or debit card transactions. So it, it, it effectively kills the ATM, ATM and one-time debit card overdraft opt-in. Now, some of you are going, well, we don't, we don't do an opt-in, so it doesn't affect us. Sure, but there are a lot of banks out there that still do an opt-in. This bill, as written currently, would kill it. Okay, completely do away with it. So overdrafts would only be allowed on checks and ACHs. But that comes with an opt-in. So they eliminate the opt-in for ATM and one-time debits. They create a new one for checks and ACHs by, by law. And then only if they opt in, can you charge them for overdrafts associated with checks and ACHs. So it's a real big shift compared to where you're at today. Again, this is just the Senate bill. Uh, no overdrafts on debit holds. Overdrafts would be limited to one a month, six per year. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, disclosures, reasonable and proportionate fees. So that's the Senate bill. Okay? It's the more restrictive of the two, but it's also the one that has gotten furthest, or that's gotten, it hasn't really gone anywhere other than been introduced. Let's take a look at that handout that you all have and the House Bill 4277. So to my knowledge, and it was a little bit of quick research yesterday and this morning, that these bills of this type have not been through a committee and been approved, if you will. This House Bill 4277 went to the House Financial Services Committee on the 27th of July. It passed by a vote of 27 to 22. Now, what are the party lines in the House Financial Services Committee? What I found just before the webinar was it's made up of 30 Democrats and 24 Republicans. So if they just vote party lines, the Democrats win, which is likely what occurred here by those who actually voted. Now, here's some more stats for you. If you're going, gosh, there's no way that this, this bill's ever going to make it through the House, right? I mean, it's it's dead on arrival, right? The numbers, as I found them just before this webinar, the House makeup is 220 Democrats to 211 Republicans. If they vote party lines, this bill passes. Okay, now, that doesn't mean it's a law yet. It's got to go through other stages. But the point is, there's more juice behind this than there ever has been in the past. And so the takeaway here, obviously, is the whole sheet of paper. But you need to go to management. Let them know what's going on. Okay, they likely have been told that overdraft reform was on the horizon. They've, been hear they've probably been hearing about that for months, years, maybe even. S things are starting to look like they're starting to go a little faster here. So let's work through some of this document that I handed out. The first thing that you're going to notice, that Roman numeral one that I have on it, Truth and Lending Act. And many of you go, what? Are we talking about deposit here? Why would they make an amendment to the Truth and Lending Act? Because that's about loans, right? Well, overdrafts have always been categorized as incidental credit which makes them subject to Reg B and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which means we need to make sure that we're not discriminating illegally when we're making decisions that are deciding whether or not to pay or return items as it relates to your overdraft practices. Okay, We'll talk more about that later today as well. The letter B, overdraft coverage fees, they're going to classify them as finance charges. Well, that's a lending thing, right? So now hopefully you're start, starting to see why it's an amendment to the Truth and Lending Act. So they're going to classify them as finance charges. 
you'll be required, if this becomes a law someday, to provide loan-like disclosures for overdraft coverage. Now, some of you might be going, well, we don't have a, an overdraft service. We just, it's a daily decision. They're grouping them all together. It doesn't matter whether you're automated or you're ad hoc based on the my read of the bill. It's if you if you pay overdrafts and allow them to go when there's no money in the account and you charge a fee, you're covered by this. So you would have to provide disclosures. Those disclosures would include overdraft fees as an annual percentage rate. You would be giving an example, kind of like you do on open-end credit, with here's what it costs if you have an overdraft. And you give a, an example of a transaction. It would give an APR. Why? So they can make informed decisions about what type of product might be best for them when they don't have enough money in their account. Like a saving suite might be a better deal or a credit card with a lower APR than what a overdraft coverage program might bring to the table. Roman numeral two, this house bill does retain the Reg E opt-in for one-time debit and ATM transactions. It does not create a new opt-in for checks and ACHs. So this is a more lenient bill than the Senate version. There would be requirements for several types of notifications uh, termination, usage, Roman numeral three and four. The overdraft fee limits, number five, one a month. That's it. You can charge one overdraft fee a month. No more than six per year. And this is all per account. Some of you are going, wait a minute. There are some people that we charge six overdrafts this morning for. We made, you know, if they're 30 bucks a piece, we made $180 on, on one customer this morning. You won't be able to do that anymore. In fact, you can only charge one a month, no more than six per year. And so at six months, you might be done charging a particular customer any types of overdraft fees. And remember, you can't charge them for ATM and one-time debits unless they opt in. And checks and ACHs, you're going to be very limited. So not only do you not get to make the income that you were making before, you're also going to, it's going to cost you more to continue to pay things into overdraft potentially. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, going, well, we'll just return everything NSF. I'm not sure that's going to be the best answer either. And I have some questions in that arena that I'll come to here in a minute. Uh, back to my, my sheet of paper here, letter C underneath Roman numeral five, no overdrafts due to debit holds ever. Okay, and that's a problem with the industry right now. We'll talk that talk about that more a little bit later on. Fees must be reasonable and proportionate based on the transaction amount and the financial institution's cost to uh, cover the overdraft. We're going to have to make some determinations there, right? Transaction posting order. However you do it, it's got to minimize overdraft fee income. So it's got to be pointing towards whatever is going to create the least amount of impact to the customer. NSF fee limits, ATM transactions, never. Debit cards, never. Fees have to be reasonable and proportionate based on the cost to the return the item for the financial institution. So that's kind of a game changer. No negative information can ever be reported in connection with overdraft coverage to a credit bureau. And then the last one, if this ever does come to fruition, one year after it passes, you will be locked into whatever your overdraft fees are. So if you're if this passes and you're looking at one a month, six per year, management can't make a quick decision and say, well, we just need to hike up those overdraft fees. Remember, they've got to be reasonable and proportionate anyway. There's a one-year moratorium on what you can do with those fees as far as increasing them if this becomes law. Now, let's back the train up here. It's just gone through a committee. But again, trying to put, put the crystal ball on the table, there's a lot of juice behind overdrafts right now, and more so than ever. And if you look at party lines, some things could happen. Now, still a long ways to go, but your management teams need to know what's lurking behind the scenes as it relates to overdrafts. So that's the congressional information I wanted to pass along to everybody today.